presentation of this program is made possible by the Oklahoma Humanities Committee. Muskogee, the name of one of the most powerful Indian nations that ever lived on the North American continent. The word Muskogee comes from an Algonquin word that means people of the lowland. No one knows when the Muskogee tribe crossed the Mississippi River and invaded what is now the southeastern United States, but we can be sure that they arrived before 1200 A.D. When the Muscogee came, they brought with them the seeds of a highly sophisticated culture, religion, and artistic tradition that flourished in what became Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee. Although somewhat changed from these earlier times, these traditions continue today with the strength and individuality that is Muscogee. Many patterns, forms, and traditions of Muscogee art date back over a thousand years. The finest examples of Muscogee art have always been reserved for religious ceremonies and for formal gatherings and meeting occasions. Before European contact, fine art was made using a variety of materials. These included wood, shell, stone, copper, split cane, and feathers. These techniques were used alone and in combination to produce great works of art. The earliest material of which examples still survive is stone. By pecking, flaking, grinding, and polishing, sculptures of the highest quality were made. Some examples of the stoneworker's art have been recovered from ceremonial mound sites at Etowah and Okmulgee, Georgia, and at Moundville, Alabama, and were sculpted 600 to 800 years ago. Animal images frequently appear in Muscogee art, such as this head of a wood duck that adorns the rim of an elegantly proportioned diorite bowl. These bowls were used as symbols of authority. This bowl is carved from limestone and portrays the king vulture, now extinct in the southeast. All of the bird's anatomical details are engraved into the bottom of the sculpture. This foot-long ceremonial axe is shaped from a single piece of stone, perhaps carried by dancers or used as a sign of rank, it copies axes of wood with stone blades called hafted celts. The use of abstract symbols is evident on this sandstone palette used for the application of body paint for ceremonials at Moundville. Its shape recalls the Muscogee ceremonial square grounds. The size of this 10-inch stone pipe indicates the importance of smoking in the southeastern culture. Carved in the image of a helmeted man, the dark red sandstone pipe was probably used only by tribal leaders. From objects such as the pipe, one sees a portrayal of the Muscogee people of the time. In sculpture of both people and animals, forms are simplified to create symbolic images of the people or animals represented. Stone effigy sculptures such as these demonstrate this striking simplicity. Early European accounts indicate the use of these figures in dances, but their exact use is not known. The same simplification seen in stoneworking is evident in the making of this baked clay water bottle, molded in a human form. Human features again clearly emerge from this buff-colored pottery jar from Alabama. In another ceramic work, perhaps an incense container, the artist forms abstract designs by cutting away areas and shaping the rim into a bird. The central part of this cylinder jar flares into the face of a Muscogee medicine bird, the owl. Some of the most complex abstract patterning occurs on incised pottery. One of the finest examples of incised pottery 
is this incised and indented blackware jar. The slick surface is the result of polishing and smoothing the clay in a semi-hardened state. Clay could be shaped into any size, form, or texture. This ceramic pipe, measuring one and a half inches in height, has a minute bird perched on the rim, a remaining statement of the artist's skill. Objects of adornment received the same detailed attention from the artists as other art forms. By carving and engraving large marine shells, the Muskogee artist created intricate two-dimensional patterns and pictorial images. Most of these shell engravings took the form of gorgets that hung from the chest of the wearer. Designs vary from abstract symbols of the sun, represented by a cross in a circle, to detailed images of people and, and animals. This shell gorget shows a man in the ceremonial dress of over 600 years ago. His elaborate copper headdress is seen, also strands of large beads around his neck. In one hand, he holds a large ceremonial mace of stone. In the other, a decapitated enemy head or a wooden rattle shaped like such a head. Another design shows an elaborate scrolled square pattern with the head of a woodpecker, a symbol of war in the southeast, on the four directions. A sun circle appears in the center. All of these artistic traditions were known throughout the Muscogee Nation, but in the early 1500s, events occurred that changed not only the artistic traditions, but also the lives and culture of the Muscogee people. In 1540, Hernando de Soto, a Spanish adventurer, arrived on the southeastern shores of the Muscogee tribal lands. Around the 1st of April, de Soto reached a Muscogee town on the banks of the Yakmogi River. To the town Miko, or headman, de Soto presented a large white ostrich plume. To the Miko of another town, he gave a yellow satin shirt and cap with another plume. These were the first articles of European clothing worn by Muscogee. These gifts were the beginning of a steady change, not only in the formal dress of the people, but of all the art forms. A sun disc gorget from Tukabachi town in Alabama was probably made from shields captured by the Muscogee at the Battle with DeSoto at Flewala tribal town in Alabama. A neck collar from the Tukabachi site closely resembles the collar piece of a soldier's helmet. With the availability of metals and other trade goods, the art of stoneworking began a steady decline. With the exception of smoking pipes, few if any major sculptures in stone were created after 1600, and most stonework took the form of tools and utilitarian goods. Other art forms, such as pottery, continued, but heavily supplemented by European wares. In a sense, the Muscogee became collectors of the cultural artifacts of the Europeans. Brass kettles, silver and gold jewelry, and quantities of trade cloth could be seen at Muscogee gatherings of the 1700s, and were also used for ceremonial purposes and in burials. During this period, European clothing was widely available in the Muscogee Nation, now called the Creek Nation by the British. As a result, formal clothing and ornamentation became the most visible and expressive of the Muscogee Creek art forms of the 1700s and 1800s. Formal clothing developed into a combination of traditional Muscogee designs and newer European forms and materials. The results of these new combinations of Muscogee Creek and European clothing can best be seen in the illustrations commissioned by the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Thomas McKenney, and later published in his book, The Indians of North America. The pictures, painted in the 1820s by Charles Byrd King and other artists, portray several of the important Creek chiefs and headmen, or Mikos. The Mikos wear the headdress of the trade era, the turban. This portrait of Chief Abothla Yehola shows his turban held together with a silver band and trimmed with silver ball and cone drops. Decorated silver bands such as this example, signed G. Gaither, 
were used to hold together calico or finger woven cloth. Other wearers left off the headband and wore only cloth. Feathers were sometimes worn in the back of the headdress. European cut hunting coats made of both hide and colored calico were worn with beaded or woven baldrics across the chest. This shoulder sash or baldric made of English stroud cloth has a beaded pattern that seems to represent a stylized floral motif. The feathered serpents beaded on a modern copy of a 19th century baldric from Oklahoma is a design dating back at least 800 years. This man's garter made from llama cloth, a type of braid sold to the Creeks, shows an ancient pattern applied to the fabric with white beads. The finest examples of southeastern beadwork ever created are the decorated shoulder bags made between 1750 and 1850. These bags, perhaps a combination of European shot pouches and Creek medicine bags, are profusely beaded with floral and geometric patterns. A portrait of Miss Tippy from the McKinney series clearly shows such a pouch with a simple snake-like beaded design. Other examples show great complexity combining several varied design motifs. The long triangular flap is a characteristic of the Muscogee Creek bags. In the early 1800s, some art forms remained unaffected by trade. This striking dance headdress shows outside influence only in the use of glass beads and red wool cloth. It was worn by the Itchy Yehola in a mock attack on an effigy enemy at certain Creek ceremonial grounds. At the same time, non-traditional items such as the pipe tomahawk came into widespread use. These non-functional hatchets became objects of prestige, much like the monolithic axes carried several hundred years earlier. The tomahawk also replaced the stone smoking pipes used by the Creeks. Two events in the 1800s had an effect on the Creek people, almost as great as the coming of the Europeans. Between 1828 and 1834, the entire Creek Nation was forcibly removed from their homelands in Alabama and Georgia and marched to what is now the state of Oklahoma. Unscrupulous contractors and hired soldiers beat, killed, and starved many Creeks in the forced marches through the winter weather. The march is now called the Trail of Tears. By the end of the journeys, over one-third of the Creek Nation died in transit to the new home. In less than 30 years, another disaster struck the tribe, the Civil War. Because of political division in the tribe, hundreds perished, many in their attempts to flee the conflict into Kansas. The effect of these events on the arts was dramatic. By 1868, few hunting coats and no turbans could be seen at a tribal meeting. The arts were moved almost exclusively to the ceremonial or square ground. The large roughened pottery jars continued in use for holding food and medicine at the buskada, or green corn ceremony, but even these became few. Polished red pottery was almost unknown in the Creek Nation Indian Territory by 1900, as is evidenced by a news article in the Eufaula Indian Journal by the Creek writer-poet Alexander Posey. Perhaps the oldest of all Muscogee Creek art forms, the art of basketry, barely survived into the 20th century. Baskets made of split river cane and split hickory wood were used to process corn and show little change from early styles. What appear to be simple undecorated baskets are actually monochrome patterns created by different weaving techniques, an approach typical of Creek understatement in art. The use of traditional Creek ladles used in conjunction with the Creek-made pottery to take medicine at ceremonials kept the art of wood carving alive in the late 1800s. Many ladles like this example were made to sell to non-Indian buyers and were intended only as aesthetic forms. 
By the late 1890s, some clothing forms introduced in the 1700s were still being worn at ceremonial occasions. These Creek boys' shirts were collected by the Presbyterian missionary, Alice Robertson, around 1900. They are of a colonial American style, over a century old. This photograph, taken in the late 1800s, shows an Oklahoma Creek man wearing a turban and silver jewelry along with the old style shirt. But by 1900, leggings had been traded for pants and moccasins for cowboy boots. The styles of the American West were exerting their influences on the art of formal Creek costuming and dress. New influences combined with older traditions again brought new forms and visions to Muscogee Creek art. Nearly all art-making activities of the 20th century, and especially the art of costuming, are focused on the annual Buscada. This event, of a serious religious nature, celebrates the ripening of the first corn and the first harvest. The structure of the ceremony remains almost unchanged from its earliest viewing by Europeans. During the ceremony, the finest Creek clothing is worn for the dancing, and the necessary ceremonial objects are brought out or made for the occasion. Some of the costumes have remained relatively unchanged for hundreds of years. The most traditional costume of the summer ceremonial cycle is worn for the stickball match, an artistic performance in itself. In one form of the game, two ball sticks or clubs of hickory wood are used by the men to throw a small hide ball across a goal. Breech cloths worn in the game show a strong adherence to tradition. These examples were made in the second half of the 19th century in Oklahoma from red wool cloth and velvet ribbons. The simple, elegant designs are characteristic of earlier works. Another breech cloth from the 1940s shows almost no change in the tapering form and ribbon lines of simple patterning. As a show of team prestige, all of the articles the player uses are bundled together in one of two prescribed ways and then hung from ceremonial arbors. The bundles serve as sculptural symbols used before the match. The best of the players wear the tails of animals whose attributes they wish to assume. In one form of the game in which women compete with the men, even the goalpost, as this example with the fish at the top shows, takes the form of a sculpture, another lingering reminder of ancient traditions from Alabama and Georgia. Another goalpost is adorned with the skull of a steer as a goal. Centuries-old traditions have been maintained in some aspects of the dancing costumes. Rattles made from tortoise shells are worn by the leaders of the ribbon dance. A modern adaptation of the rattles are made from milk cans. The practice is not due to a lack of tortoise shell, but a preference for the rattle sound made by the cans. In their hands, the ribbon dancers carry a sculpture of a knife called an atashi. The object may date to the period when flint blades and maces were carried in dances. The full cut skirts and blouses are derived from Victorian fashion and have been popular since the Civil War. These skirts from New Tulsa tribal grounds in Oklahoma were made in the early 1960s. They display color and compositional concerns found in the best fabric and textile art. Several items of men's formal dance dress are also worn for the stickball match. One item is the sash. The yarn sashes are made by weaving on a loom or without a loom by finger weaving. The sashes have braided ties with large tassels on the ends. This sash has ties on both sides, a style that can be seen on early Muscogee engraved shell. For the buffalo dance leader, the hunting coat of the 17 and 1800s has survived as the red coat. 
With modernized lines and fabric, the coat still has the color of the old coat and the red coloring, the traditional color of war, to identify the lead buffalo dancer. The lead dancer carries a cane or ball sticks which represent the front legs of the animal. The tip of this cane is carved into a buffalo's hoof. The letter H on the front is the initial of the owner. The most minimal and the most striking of all Creek art objects are the feather dance wands carried by the feather hooper or Dafu Umpeka. White crane feathers, black crow feathers, and sometimes eagle feathers are all used, tied to the long river cane poles carried by the dancers. At modern Creek ceremonials, the turban style headdress of an earlier period has been replaced by the Creek style cowboy hat. A hat band of beadwork or woven yarn is first put around the crown of the hat. To the back of the hat is tied a siga lega, or horsehair roach, with two eagle feathers in the center for the leader. The siga lega is also worn by stickball players. In the right front side of the hat band is attached a split white crane feather to complete the headdress. When properly made, the hat takes its own motion from the cues of the dancer's movements. The crane feather tip almost squirms as the headdress shakes. The eagle feathers bob to the rhythm of the dance, all a part of the sculptural effect of the headdress. Since the late 1960s, the pressure of outside influences has again brought change to Creek art. A number of Creek people have left the rural Oklahoma homes and received training and education at non-Creek institutions. At schools, colleges, and universities, Creek artists learn to create art for a market outside the reaches of the traditional square ground. On their return to Creek country, the centuries-old Muscogee Creek ways reshape and change the artists. A new blend of old traditions and modern ways is the result. To the non-Indian viewer, the change first became most visible in the European method of painting as practiced by Muscogee Creek artists. Creek artists Solomon McCombs and Jerome Tiger used scenes from the square ground ceremonies and dances as subjects for their paintings and drawings. But the most direct influence of the traditional forms and designs of the square ground are apparent in the art of personal adornment and fashion design. After an education in art and jewelry design from the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Nagovti Scott, of Creek and Cherokee descent, returned home to Oklahoma. There, a Creek medicine man urged him to turn to the tribal past for inspiration. The inspiration took the form of engraved shell gorgets and beads. Using both traditional and modern design and techniques, Nagofti creates pieces for both Indian and non-Indian buyers. Using purple freshwater mussel shells, he grinds out the rough forms on machines and by hand. This design comes from an early Muscogee gorget from Moundville, Alabama, and shows a sun circle, perhaps surrounded by cloud symbols. Another shows a modern translation of an ancient engraving of a singer. A visit to the Fife Collection in Henrietta, Oklahoma, reveals not one, but a family of artists influenced by traditional Creek forms and designs, approaching fashion design as the most personal expression of sculptural art. Sharon Fife Mouse, Sandy Fife Wilson, and Phyllis Fife have succeeded in designing, making, and marketing original clothing designs and accessories, and more recently, quilts. This finger-woven sash, made by Sandy Fife, shows the use of a traditional technique and design. A casual one-shoulder dress of silk utilizes an appliqued cloth design of a sun symbol from a Muscogee shell gorget. The woodpecker motif stitched onto this tailored western-style silk suit 
comes from an ancient Moundville paint palette. The same pattern follows the hem of this modern, non-Indian cut dress of soft jersey. These striking quilts made by Carmen Fife, the mother of the artist, have visual similarities to 20th century abstract paintings. The individual piecing follows both Creek and Seminole traditions. The center block takes the age-old spiral pattern. Both Nagov T. Scott and the artists of the Fife Collection have found a responsive audience in the Indian community. On occasion, ribbon shirts with the Fife Collection label can be seen at weekend dances at the ceremonial grounds. And the purple mussel shell gorgets are sometimes seen at formal Indian gatherings. The future will undoubtedly bring more changes and influences. New forms will replace the old ones, but they will still fulfill the traditional roles in the green corn ceremony. Other art forms may live as long as the ceremony itself. Thank <laughs> you.